I'm Sam Lat with SL Advisors. We invest in midstream energy infrastructure. That's pipelines, storage, and processing. We sit between the producers of oil and gas and the customers, which are often utilities, export terminals, or refineries. We publish a blog twice a week on the energy sector and on interest rates because I spent much of my career in the bond market. In this video, I'm going to recap the blog post of March 2022 and talk about some of the reaction from our clients and readers. Ever since Russia invaded Ukraine, this has been the dominant story affecting financial markets. The impact has extended well beyond oil and gas and is driving prices higher in other areas that weren't obvious, such as farming. But we'll focus here on energy, because that's what we do. Few thought the pipeline sector could fall as far as it did two years ago during the early months of COVID. Since then, pipelines have had a spectacular run. In fact, if you'd invested in the American Energy Independence Index at the end of 2019, you'd have matched the return on the S&P 500. By the end of March 2022, the pipeline index was even slightly ahead. Investors sometimes ask, hasn't this sector already made its move? They remember how bad things looked two years ago and are worried about buying just before another big drop. But research from Wells Fargo compares the sector's enterprise value to cash flow, or EV to EBITDA, over the past 15 years. This shows that compared to history, pipelines are still cheap. If that EV to EBITDA ratio increased from 10.1 where it is now to the long-term average of 12.2, we estimated the stock prices could rise as much as 40% from here. Another thing to remember is that the energy sector went from 16% of the S&P 500 to just over 2%. It's currently at 4%. Energy has been such a strong performer this year that having an underweight can really hurt returns. The S&P Energy ETF, XLE, has beaten the market by 40% so far in 2022. Assuming a 3% weighting as of the end of last year means an investor with no energy exposure has lagged by over 1%. Energy as a percentage of the S&P 500 continues to increase, and it's forcing investors to, at a minimum, get back to equal weight. Wells Fargo reported seeing some evidence of this, and believes this new buying as investors shift back to neutral weight could add further support to the energy sector. Liquefied natural gas, or LNG, also drew a good bit of attention in March. We've liked natural gas over crude oil for years. It has a much clearer growth path because it's difficult to handle. This means pipelines and LNG facilities require long-term contracts before they're built. We were interested to learn that according to the International Energy Agency, US LNG exports have been the biggest source of reduced CO2 emissions in the world, more effective even than Germany's energy transition. In 2019, a German court criticized the 160 billion euro cost as being in extreme disproportion to the value added. This is because Germany's taxpayers and power customers have had to foot the bill. Meanwhile, US LNG exports have achieved more good for the planet without requiring huge subsidies from the federal government. This is because they usually displace coal, which cuts CO2 emissions in half and also greatly reduces local pollution. We've been convinced of the benefits to the planet of US natural gas for a long time. But Russia's invasion of Ukraine has added a huge new dimension. Now that Western European countries have suddenly found that energy security is something they should be worried about, the prospects for increased US LNG exports are even better. Since Russia's invasion, several LNG stocks have rallied strongly. Most investors have heard of Chenier, the leading exporter of US LNG. But there are quite a few other companies with plans to export LNG. We had the good fortune to chat with Michael Mott in March. He heads Next Carbon Solutions, a division of Next Decade that's focused on eliminating 90% of the CO2 involved in producing natural gas and converting it into LNG. They call this net zero LNG because they plan to capture almost all the emissions involved before shipping it off to the customer. 
Next Decade needs to sign up enough buyers with long-term commitments that they can raise the necessary financing to move ahead with building their Rio Grande facility. These projects always take a long time, and there will be opposition from environmentalists, so they still have some hurdles to clear. I can sympathize with people who don't want to see an industrial facility built in a place they love. But if we're going to lower emissions around the world, natural gas is going to be needed in a big way. It's hard to be against LNG development and still claim to be worried about climate change. We're not going to run the world on solar panels and windmills. And unfortunately, too many environmental extremists are opposed to everything else, including nuclear power. By coincidence, the day after we chatted with the company, they announced a 20-year deal with a big Chinese utility. We had thought that the natural buyers would be European because they're more concerned about emissions than most Asian countries, and we still expect that to be the case. But it was a nice surprise to see the news and the way that and other LNG stocks have performed. Germany, more than any other West European country, committed a huge mistake in relying so heavily on Russia for their energy. Now they've realized it, and this represents a big opportunity for US exporters to help Europeans gain more control over supplies. Finally, I want to talk about the Federal Reserve. There's always something to say about them. The Fed is getting lots of criticism from people like Larry Summers, and Bill Dudley, former head of the New York Fed and someone I've played golf with from time to time. Both are very critical of the Fed for letting inflation get so out of control. On this topic, the Fed's an easy target. The futures market now expects that they'll have to raise short-term rates to 3% to get inflation lower. That may not be enough. The Federal Open Market Committee makes projections over the next few years for GDP, unemployment, inflation, and short-term rates. Larry Summers thinks they're being too optimistic, and you can see it on the dots on this chart. The Fed doesn't expect to have to raise rates that much to reduce inflation. Bill Dudley criticizes them for being too reactive. In the past, the Fed would have started tightening much earlier, but this Fed is prioritizing employment with a greater willingness to risk inflation. In that sense, by their own metric, the Fed has been successful because their policies have helped make sure that everyone who wants a job has one. Now they've started to raise rates, but once the economy begins to slow and see the unemployment rate start to pick up, they're going to be very uncomfortable. Personally, I'm skeptical that they're willing to go far enough to cause much of an economic slowdown in pursuit of lower inflation. They may overdo it and cause a recession anyway, but I think they'll regard that as a bigger mistake than previous Fed boards would with their dual mandate equally weighted between full employment and stable prices. That's how it used to work. The Fed has become part of the market story. Russia's invasion has made a bad inflation situation worse. The Fed will have no shortage of critics and will be a rich source of blog posts in the months ahead. If you read our blog regularly, I hope you enjoy it. And if you haven't seen it yet, I hope this video will persuade you to take a look. We always love to hear from you. So if you have any comments or blog ideas, let me know. To find out more about what we're thinking, visit our website, sl-advisors.com. I'm Simon Lack with SL Advisors. Thank you for watching this video.